Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, India's first Future Tech Meets Sustainability podcast. And today I'm delighted and honored to have with me Dr. Christoph Gugel, who is the co-founder of G Tech Medical Engineering. which has been developing high performance brain computer interfaces and neurotechnologies for invasive as well as non invasive recordings dr google oversees the global distribution and utilization of gtex products in clinical environments for research purposes such as the analysis of the brain heart or muscle activity brain assessment of severe brain injuries disorders of consciousness motor rehabilitation after stroke neuromarketing deep brain stimulation brain mapping neuroprosthesis control communication painting in closed loop invasive and non invasive bci experiments so dr really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast <clears throat> one we start with gtech what was the inspiration when did you start gtech and what is gtech all about uh edi thank you for the invitation so i started gtech about 25 years ago and the inspiration actually came when i was studying in the us at johns hopkins university so i had a new engineering course and they showed me publications about the brain computer interface from gerd pfuchela back in graz in austria this was actually my university where i studied electrical engineering and after the us i returned home and then i started my master thesis about brain computer interfaces and afterwards my phd dissertation and during the dissertation people were already asking if they could buy the brain computer interface from me so i established uh, gtech medical engineering together with günter edlinger and right after the end of my thesis i sold the first bci system to england This was Oxford University, and the second system went to South Korea. And I forgot actually the third customer that we had. So I want to get into the G Tech and uh, another products that you have. But before you we get into that, I think it'll be nice if you could give a brief explanation of brain computer interfaces. What are they, and 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 break it down between the invasive as well as the non-invasive BCIs. So brain computer interfaces measure brain activity. Uh, when we are using non-invasive sensors, then we just put EEG electrodes on the scalp. This is like in a hospital, and then we can record from different regions of the brain. The brain-computer interface gets all the EEG data, analyzes it, and then we can move, for example, a cursor on the screen, or we can control a prosthetic device. So there are many different applications. And in contrast, for invasive BCIs, we need also a neurosurgeon. Uh, the neurosurgeon implants the electrodes directly on the cortex so this means they have to remove the scalp and afterwards they can implant the electrodes and then these electrodes are also connected to a brain computer interface and then we can analyze the data coming directly from the cortex and this normally gives us much better resolution because these electrodes are smaller and we can pick up the brain waves with much more resolution than when we mesh on the scalp non invasive uh, brain computer interfaces don't pick up all the data uh, invasive bcis have the capabilities of understanding the cognitive function in a deeper ways which could be used for much better applications uh, could you talk about the cutting edge of both invasive as well as non invasive bci and the applications It's not really that one is much better than the other one in general. So there are different applications where the EEG is just a good signal and the other applications where the ECOG is just a good signal. You, it's just depending on what you want to do with it. So the resolution, the spatial resolution with the non-invasive sensors is of course limited. And we are using it nowadays, for example, for stroke or multiple sclerosis, neuro rehabilitation. So in this case, we ask patients to imagine left hand movement, right hand movement, left or right leg movement. The brain computer interface is supposed to pick up when the person imagines the certain type of movement. And for that, we put EEG electrodes over the sensory motor cortex. So we need typically about 16 sensors, which are placed central, centrally. 
over the cortex. And this is just good enough to give us left hand, right hand and foot movement. And we don't need invasive sensors for doing that. And if the brain computer interface is able to pick up the left hand movement, then we trigger in real time a functional electrical stimulation of the left arms muscles so that the hand is really moving. And this pairing of cognitive functions and motor behavior leads to neuroplasticity. And at the end, patients can move their hands much better, faster, have better coordination of movements and less spasticity. So for this type of application, we don't need invasive sensors at all. It's good enough with EEG. And it would also be very unpractical practical to implant uh, ECOG sensors into the stroke or multiple sclerosis patients because it would be highly invasive. And this is something that you don't want to have for this application. On the other hand side, if somebody is uh, uh, handicapped, for example, a spinal cord injury and cannot really move, and we can implant a brain-computer interface, which is able to provide locomotion to the patient together with exoskeleton, for example, then it's, of course, much more practical to implant the device so that it's always working and you don't have to put on the EEG device on the human brain. It's just always there. Then invasive sensors are much better for this application. Right. Uh, how much do we understand of uh, the human brain at this point of time? And uh, what's the role of these brain computer interfaces in uh, understanding our, our cognitive functions, you know, both, both the structural and the functional capabilities? How much do we understand at this point of time? Yeah, what we understand is still very limited. And I just give you one example. So we have one medical product that's called Cortex U. So it's doing a high gamma mapping of cortical functions. This means we are bringing an epilepsy patient or a tumor patient into a certain state by telling him solve, for example, Rubik's cube. And then they are moving all the fingers uh, to solve the cube. And at the same time, we can investigate brain waves to find responsible brain areas for finger movements. So this is pretty easy to do. And many people uh, were researching this topic before. For the neurosurgeon, it's very key information to know where the fingers are located on the cortex, because if he resects this region, then the person cannot move the fingers anymore. This is, of course, a problem. But there are also other areas activated when we are doing this mapping procedure. So we are showing Rubik's Cube to the patient, and this is the instruction for him to solve Rubik's Cube. When the patient sees the image on the computer of Rubik's Cube, this is activating also color regions and shape regions, which are the temporal base, more or less on the bottom of the brain. And these are regions which are much less known. So as soon as a human being sees colors, a certain region gets activated. And as soon as a human being sees a certain shape, like the cube, then another region on the temporal base gets activated. The same is the case with faces. So if I look into Eddie's face, then my fusiform face area is activated. So that's the region responsible for identifying people. And this is a region that nobody knew just a few years ago, and we did experiments with Dr. Kamada in Japan. And then always this region was activated. And we noticed that this is actually the face region responsible for recognizing faces. And Dr. Kamada just resected this region uh, a few years before, and this had the consequence that an epilepsy patient couldn't recognize family members anymore. So this is actually pretty bad. And now with the high gamma mapping system that we do or provide with PCI technology, we are able to identify where the face region is located and Dr. Kamada can keep the region. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about neuromodulation and deep, uh, deep brain stimulation, like understanding a brain and maybe, you know, neuromodulating a specific a a area of the brain? What, what, what are the, how, how, how can we append healthcare, you know, when, when we understand this and what are the, the cutting edge of technology of, uh, these neuromodulation and DBS? So I give you two examples for neuromodulation. One non-invasively done, the other one invasively done. So I mentioned beforehand the stroke and the multiple sclerosis neurorehabilitation. In this case, 
the person is sitting in front of a computer and we instruct the person to imagine, for example, the left hand or the right hand. Then the brain-computer interface is able to pick it up. So as soon as the brain is doing the certain type of movement imagination, then we trigger the functional electrical stimulator on the left hand or on the right hand. And this pairs our cognitive processes with motor behavior. And we are doing this in total 6,000 times per patient. So this means we are producing action potentials 6,000 times. And this produces neuroplasticity. So because of the stroke or because of multiple sclerosis, some neurons are damaged. So they cannot produce action potentials anymore. But neighboring uh, neurons can take over this function. And by sending 6,000 times the action potentials down the neurons, we can produce this neuroplasticity. This means healthy neurons, which are close by, grow into certain directions and they form new connections to existing neurons. And this improves fine and cross motoric skill in patients. When we are going to invasive uh, neuromodulation, then people are inserting depth electrodes into deep structures of the brain. For example, the thalamus in Parkinson patients, and then they provide electrical stimulation of the thalamus. This region is called STN, and this reduces tremor. So for Parkinson patients, uncontrolled movements and tremor are a big problem. And by stimulating this STN region, this can be nicely reduced in some of the patients. And at the same time, we can also measure, for example, on the prefrontal cortex, if there are certain biomarkers which are decoding the tremor, then the brain-computer interface can recognize these biomarkers, for example, beta activity, and on demand, we can switch on the electrical stimulation in the thalamus. So this uh, limits the amount of brain stimulation that you have to do because it has also side effects. And of course, you, you want to control or eliminate the side effects as much as possible. So this is a kind of on-demand neurostimulation of deep brain structures. Now, you, in the course of the conversation, you were mentioning that, you know, we, we, we don't understand the human brain completely. What would it take for us to understand the entire uh, structure as well as functional capabilities of the brain? Because the human brain has got like 80 million neurons, 100 trillion synapses, and there's a whole lot of things going on over there, you know, which gives rise to our entire uh, senses, you know, our perception. How do you, do, do you have like an idea of how do we reach over there? When do we get to a point where we uh, understand the entire structural, functional capabilities of a human brain? Yeah, this, this will take a few years more, but with current technology, we can already do a lot. So we develop, for example, a so-called embodiment station. And this means we can stimulate the human being with many different functions like auditory functions. We can show them different pictures. We can provide vibrotactile stimulation to produce sensation. And at the same time, we have ECOG sensors. So invasive sensors on the cortex and we can do the high gamma mapping so we can identify which region is responsible for something. If we place, for example, the vibrotactile stimulator on the pinky finger, on the small finger, and we stimulate it for a few moments, then we find uh, one, two seconds later where the pinky finger sensation area is located in the sensory motor cortex. And in this way, we can measure the whole human cortex um, so for, for motor functions, sensation, visual processing, auditory processing, the, this is pretty easy to do because we can just show different images or we provide stimulation to the uh, person. For other things like emotions or memories, deja vu, experience and so on, it's much more complicated to induce it. For this, you need actually live sensation. And you have to monitor the human being in real life. And then you can pinpoint these functions. Like mentioned before, this is much more complicated to do. And you need also invasive technology to get enough resolution. And of course, we have also deep brain structures like the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory, short term memory or long term memory. And then you 
you have to understand what the human brain does at the moment to decode what the hippocampus is doing. So these experiments get pretty complicated uh, pretty soon. And it's not, or it's very common that one researcher spends his life just with one brain region to understand it. So we need a lot of work to do to fully understand the human brain. A uh, blue brain project is one of them. Henry Markham is, is trying to, you know, understand uh, the u- human brain. Who, who are the other peers, according to you, who are uh, at least the, they're taking the right approach to understand the entire human brain? So Kai Miller from Mayo Clinic does fantastic experiments. He's a neurosurgeon at Mayo and he has also a PhD degree. So he developed for many years BCI technology as an engineer before. And then he became a neurosurgeon and this is exactly what we need for doing such experiments. So somebody has to understand the engineering, but also the medical applications. And then you are able to set up experiments which are groundbreaking because you can put electrodes into interesting brain regions. And at the same time, you can do all the engineering that's required for running such experiments. And this is super important also for the future to have different experts working together to realize that. This is also what's happening in the Human Brain Project here in Europe for building a cortical atlas. But there are also many projects in the US and Asia which are doing similar experiments. The Neuralink chip today, I think somewhere around 1024 electrodes. What technology do you think will it take for us to maybe miniaturize these chips further so that they have more electrodes, which reads up a wider area of the brain, uh, giving us better resolution? In the brain, certain functions are coded on certain regions. So if we look, for example, at different fingers, then we need a few square centimeters to cover all the five fingers. Uh, of the left hand and the same for the right hand. So the right hand is, for example, located on the left hemisphere. And when you are overlaying an area of about five by five centimeters, then you get full resolution of all five finger movements. So this means you need enough electrodes uh, to cover this region, but then you only get finger movements and you don't get, for example, leg movements. So for decoding leg, function, you need another array overlaying exactly the leg region. The same is the case for the auditory cortex. There's, for example, Wernicke's area, which is responsible to understand language. So while you are talking English, my Wernicke area is active to understand what you are saying. And also in this case, I need electrodes exactly at this location. And for the phasiform, uh, fusiform phase region, I need electrodes on the temporal base. Uh, I pretty high density ECOG array to decode uh, phase information. And this would mean that you have to place electrodes all around your brain on the locations where function is decoded. And this is just very impractical because you, you cannot really do an implant on every single place of the human brain. So what people are trying to do is to place, for example, an implant over the sensory motor cortex if somebody is locked in or has a spinal cord injury, and then you can decode motor functions for controlling an exoskeleton. Uh, in If somebody has depression, then people are working on different brain stimulation techniques. So they put electrodes in different regions of the cortex and when they provide electrical stimulation they can reduce depression but in this case you're using other brain areas than for the motor functions this is application dependent so you really have to choose what you want to do and then you can implant something it's just very unpractical to record from every single pixel of the brain with many, many electrodes, the technology is already there, so we would be able to do it. But of course, nobody wants to implant the patient with so many electrodes just for research applications. It's also uh, risky and and nobody wants to have that. Earlier, you spoke about your product, CortiQ. You also have this product called Recovery Rec- uh, Recoverex. Can you talk about the overview of GTEx products uh, and uh, where are they sold and how has it been helping uh, patients. 
So about 25 years ago, we started with brain computer interfaces and they are used in different research applications or for the developing of different BCI applications. So we have different biosignal amplifiers, we have different stimulators, we have neuromodulation setups that are used by university hospitals, uh, by engineering schools, but also by industry, pharma or aviation, and they do different neuroscience experiments or BCI developments. And about 10 years ago, we started also with medical products. And at the moment, we have recoveries, like you mentioned before. So this is a brain-computer interface that we use to treat stroke patients and patients with multiple sclerosis. So they have to come for 25 treatments into one of our recovery centers. Each treatment lasts about one hour. And then we get highly significant improvements of spasticity and motor control. So this works even 10, 20 or 30 years after people had a stroke. And this is in contrast to the medical opinion because every stroke patient here hears that there is no improvement after one year. But it's just not the case. People get much better even many, many years after the stroke. And if we look at multiple sclerosis patients, then they get a lot of medication. So here in Austria, the medication is costing 50,000 euros per year. And they have to take it to slow down the multiple sclerosis. And with our recovery system, we can make them better. So it's the first system which makes actually MS patients better. And we're also speaking about making our patients better again and not worse uh, or declining or slowing down the decline. Um, so it's very important for these patients. And we see also a lot of side effects, like they have better temperature controlled in the affected limbs. We have reduced tremor. We have reduced pain. People have better language functions, so speech improves. This, improves. It is pretty funny because we are training them on motor movements and suddenly they speak better. The explanation is that with the hand movement imaginations or leg movement imaginations, we are activating the sensory motor cortex. And for language, you are also needing the tongue and mouth functions. And if you look at the language network, then first of all, we need the auditory cortex to hear speech. Then we need Wernicke's area to understand what somebody is saying. And then we need Broca's area to produce the answer to a question. And finally, we are moving or needing the, the tongue and the mouth region of the brain to produce the language. And with recovery, we can activate exactly these motor regions. This has an effect on the whole language network, and this is the scientific explanation why we get also better speech in these patients with recovery. And another medical product is Corte-Q. This is a high gamma mapping system where we implant electrodes directly on the cortex, and this is used in epilepsy and tumor patients. So for epilepsy patients, the neurosurgeon has to remove the sources of the epilepsy from the brain. And for that, he has to understand where the epilepsy comes from. But he also has to understand where the eloquent cortex is located. So these are the most important centers of your brain that you are needing to move your fingers, for example, or that you can recognize faces or that you understand language. And with the high gamma mapping system, within a few minutes, we can find these important centers. So we are just asking the person to solve Rubik's Cube, to listen to an English story, to look at different images. And then we have the most important centers and then the neurosurgeon knows what he should not remove. And this means he can resect the tumor or the sources of the epilepsy much more precise. This leads at the end also to a longer life of the patient. So there's a nice group study from the US that showed when neurosurgeons are using Corte-Q, the tumor patients are living longer because they were able to resect uh, much better the tumor. This is, of course, very important for, for the patient to keep important brain functions and to live longer. And the last product line that we have is our unicorn uh, hybrid black 
PCI system. And this is more or less a low-cost PCI system, which is very affordable. And this is something that makers, developers, and so on use to produce nice PCI applications. So we are running also a hackathon uh, multiple times a year. And then developers, engineers, scientists, artists meet together for a few days and they come up with very innovative new PCI applications. Well, speak to about the availability of your products. Are they easily available around the world? Is it available in India? You mentioned about the hackathon. Uh, of the hackathons, I think it's a very, very interesting way to kind of, you know, gather the stakeholders, engineers, scientists, help them kind of uh, create applications, you know, which, which can upend the healthcare system. Out of the hackathons, what are the interesting applications that come out where you, where you leveraging your GTEC BCIs, which you think are, are, are being used or will be used uh, in clinical uh, usage? So we are selling our products uh, into more than 100 countries. So nowadays that's pretty easy. We have also a online shop where people can just order it. And on the next day, they already get the Unicorn Hybrid Black also in India, of course. So in India, there's a, a lot of very good research ongoing, um, which is, of course, very important. And for the hackathons, we offer always four different types of projects. So there are programming projects, and then developers control, for example, a smart home environment with the brain computer interface. And then mentally you can switch on the light or you can t control a TV set. We have also little robots like the Sphero robot that's produced in Boulder in Colorado. And then you can control the, the robot with the PCI system mentally. And then People are also very creative. So they put, for example, paint onto the robot and then they let the mob robot move around. And this can be used to produce paintings, which are very nicely looking. Or at one hackathon in Valencia, they produced a game with the robot in augmented reality game. And then the two spheres, the two robots were fighting against each other. Um, so it's very in innovative what's happening. And we had also a gin tonic robot. So in this case, people were measuring brain waves and they used a biomarker for, for cognitive engagement and relaxation. And if the person was more relaxed, then the gin and tonic robot put more tonic into the cocktail. And if the person was more stressed, then the person got more gin into the cocktail. So this was a pretty funny project developed during the hackathon. So you can also control something like super weapons with the brain computer interface and only with the PCI system you can fire the weapon and then the PCI system suddenly becomes very useful and also fun to be used in the game. And especially in the hackathons, they were coming up with very innovative PCI uh, games which are funny to play and people just like it. And then we have also artistic projects. So in this case, Artists can meet with engineers and scientists and together they can come up with very innovative applications. So we work together, for example, with Anu Kwiprecht recently and, and we developed a screen dress. So she's a fashion designer and she put uh, six little screens into the into the dress, which were BCI controlled. And with the BCI system, we could extract cognitive float so if the person was highly engaged or less engaged and on the displays, we showed eyes and the eyes were opening. If people were more cognitively engaged and they were closing, if they did less. So it was a real time processing example of this fashion tech. It's just a very nice example of the cooperation of engineers with fashion designers and artists. And the last category that we have are data sets, which are recorded from stroke patients, from epilepsy patients, from locked in patients that cannot move at all. And then uh, hackathon participants can work on signal processing techniques, for example, so they can implement new feature extraction or classification techniques to 
make the BCI system more robust, to make it faster, and to allow, for example, a locked-in patient to communicate with higher speed. When you talk about brain-computer interface technology, largely you associate with healthcare applications, you know, specific, specific to, you know, neural conditions. But here you are with the hackathons, you know, enabling artists, creatives, gamers to build applications uh, across uh, the, the field and not just restricted only for the healthcare so that's that's very very, very cool uh, <clears throat> could you could you uh, i mean uh, talk about the role of ai with uh, brain computer interface because you know through these e devices and ecog there's obviously you read up a certain uh, areas of the signal how how does what what's the role of uh, machine learning over here to kind of decipher the data into making something or creating something inferring it to making it something useful you know, of course, we are using signal processing techniques for since the beginning of BCIs because we just get too much information from the EEG or ECOG because we are reading from usually eight to 1024 sensors of the brain. And the human eye can just not interpret the EEG or ECOG signal coming in. So you need signal processing techniques to understand what's ongoing in machine learning or classification techniques are super important for doing that because otherwise it, for the human eye it looks more or less like noise and it's impossible to interpret what's ongoing. So with these techniques we are under, able to understand what's happening in the brain and we can make uh, and extract useful information. Same is the case for biomarkers, so we need AI tools or machine learning techniques to understand what is an important biomarker. And when we come back to recoverix, when we are extracting, for example, five minutes of resting state EEG data, we can predict how much better. So this means how much motor improvements we will get for a stroke patient. This is just very nice because otherwise we wouldn't know how much a patient gets better. And with five minutes of EEG recorded together with the AI techniques, we can predict it. And this is very important for a patient because it helps him to understand if the rehabilitation is useful for him or if it's just a waste of time. And it's also super important for insurance companies because they get with a certain likelihood how much improvement you can uh, predict and estimate. And this, this is another super important application. And we are running our own recovery centers here where we treat stroke and multiple sclerosis patients. And up to now, we did more than 30,000 treatments. So this means we have more than 30,000 brain recordings. And then we can, of course, use AI technology to find uh, certain biomarkers in the data. And the prediction, for example, is something that was coming out of all these data sets. So we looked at 30,000 data sets. And this allowed us to understand what is the biomarker for predicting the improvements. So all these signal processing techniques are super important for brain computer interfaces. We, we spoke about the pros of brain, uh, you know, brain computer interfaces. I mean, I think in the next maybe a decade or so, when we are uh, able to create non-invasive BCIs, I'm sure there'll be more and more people who would want to augment it for use cases, which is more, not uh, uh, inclined towards always towards good. You were mentioning about exoskeleton. We, there is at this point in time, as we speak, there is uh, a war going on, you know, between Israel and uh, Palestine. Uh, do you see the use of brain computer interfaces uh, being used in uh, things which are not nice in, in, in the coming future? And if yes, what would be those applications you think uh, could be uh, developed from uh, the use of brain computer interfaces? Yeah, I'm not so much concerned about the abuse of BCI systems because at the end you, you have to calibrate the brain computer interface on certain functions of the human being. So in the case of recoverix, we calibrate the BCI system to recognize left hand movement, right hand movement and leg movement. And this is all what the brain computer interface actually can decode. So the, there's no harm in that if somebody else in the worst case understands if you're now imagining left, right or leg movement. And this is actually the limit what you can decode of the human brain. Um, 
And if you look at communication BCI systems, then you can select letters, characters with a speed at the moment of two to three seconds per character so that you can communicate. And also in this case, there's no harm because in the worst case, you are just not, you know, focusing on a certain character that you want to communicate and then nothing is happening. So also in this case, the BCI system is calibrated on a certain function. Now our PCI award winner of 2023 uh, uh, decoded, for example, speech. So in this case, the person, the, the paralyzed person had to imagine certain words. And then the PCI system was used to decode it. Um, but, but if you just don't want to use this, then, then don't switch it on or just don't use it as a language decoding BCI system. So people still have the choice in doing that. And for these more invasive brain computer interfaces, you know, they're heavily controlled. So in Europe, they're under the medical directive in the USA, FDA controls it. And to bring a product to the market, you have to show it safe and e efficient. And otherwise it will never be FDA or CE cleared and you are not allowed to use it with patients. So there must be a clear benefit for the patient to be allowed to use it. And nobody will get the brain implant just for fun. There must be a reason for doing it. Uh, could you speak to about uh, neuromarketing? Because, you know, in, in a present day, you know, the, the web 2.0, we, we have companies which has been manipulating our data and, and has nudged us unknowingly to buy things or vote for uh, a specific party and things like that. And this is very basic rudimentary where the uh, application that we are on can, uh, you know, manipulate you. What? How, how do you think uh, this neuromarketing will be able to manipulate us. It's not really manipulation. So with the Blondie check or this picture ranking software, we can just figure out what, what is getting your attention. So the BCI system is again calibrated on your personal EEG data, and then you can rank pictures. And we use an attention marker from the EEG signal, which is encoded in evoke potentials. And what we can extract are, for example, logos that give or produce more attention than other logos. So this can be related to shape. This can be related to color. This can be related to the meaning of the logo and so on. And this is something uh, which allows you to figure out very systematically such information, how the human brain is reacting to certain information. This is, of course, very useful for companies to shape your logo in a way that key gets the attention of, of uh, people. So I don't see it in a negative way, because at the end, we just get better logos, which are more entertaining and, and which attracts attention. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Obviously, it's it's not something which is uh, uh, a problematic at this point in time. But in the future, if uh, or a web two o can manipulate us in if, if, even with the basic rudimentary tech, what would uh, uh, these companies do if he, they had the hold of uh, neurotechnologies? My last question to you: uh, Would would you be able to paint a picture? of what the world would look like, what healthcare would look like, specifically neuro uh, uh, health in the next 10 years. So so I don't see brain computer interfaces in a, in a negative way at all, Be, because first of all, the, it's extracting information of the brain. And for medical applications, if you're looking into patients, you have to show anyhow that it's efficient and safe. So you will never get medical approval if it's not productive for the patient and good for the patient. Uh, because the rules are the strictest rules of the world. So medical products are even stricter than aviation. So an airplane has less regulations than a medical product. So it will be impossible for any company to bring something to the market, which is not good for the patient. So in this way, I, I don't see any abuse. And if you're talking about manipulation, the, this is also happening without BCI technology. So you don't need a BCI system to manipulate somebody. So it has nothing to do with neurotechnology and people will also use it in, in this way. But 
has nothing to do with neurotechnology. In terms of medical application, there, there will be much more in 5, 10 and 20 years because up to now there was not so much. But BCI systems are useful in so many different types of applications. We are working also on with coma patients or patients in disorders of consciousness. So they are a little bit better than coma. And they are lying, for example, in bed. They don't react, they don't move, and nobody knows if they have cognitive functions or if they have command following. This means if they understand language. And with BCI technology, in a few seconds, we can figure out if these patients are able to follow conversations. Uh, so the brain-computer interface just tells us this person understands conversations or not. And this is the key information that family members need, for example. So if your mother in the hospital understands you, then it makes, for example, fully sense to to visit her pretty often. But also on the other hand side, if they don't understand you, maybe it's not so useful to visit every day because it's just a waste of time. And the same is the case for physicians. As soon as a physician understands that the patient understands everything, they're much more motivated to do something for the patient. Um, so this is just another example where it's very important. Or we have also a client in Canada and they are working on biomarkers of for concussion. So they have a lot of ice hockey players in Canada. And very often people don't know if they have a concussion. And with the BCI system, they are able to extract it after a few minutes. And then you can treat the ice hockey player immediately after the game. And this will lead to better health of the ice hockey player. So also very important and otherwise just hidden in the EEG data and new uh, scientists or neurologists don't know how to interpret it and with BCI uh, technology they are able to do it correctly. Right. Uh, so Dr. Christoph, really, really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. Uh, wish you and the team the very best. I think exciting things happening in the space of BCI. Uh, what I was hinting at is, is that tech is never good or bad. It's the way how we humans tend to use it. You rightfully pointed out that for medical application, it has got to go through a multiple clearances, you know, of uh, uh, FDAs and uh, but you know, look at the tech tech business. You know, I mean, a company like OpenAI, you know, it releases an application without any. You you put it on an app store as soon as you create that. There is no that there is no process of quality check whether it's so. So what I was hinting at is, is not just the medical field. I mean, you know, technology per se is never good or bad it's the humans how we tend to use it and there'll be always be those fringe elements who will understand the opportunity of using a great technology in a bad way so that's what i was hinting at so but yes i think a fantastic point of time you're sitting in at a fantastic point of time technologies are converging and brain computer interface i think we humans have been forever kind of probing and trying to understand the 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 biggest mystery in the world, a human brain, you know, <laughs> and now we are coming closer and closer of understanding, you know, what a human brain does into creating this intelligence and we still away from understanding consciousness. But I guess once we understand this completely, the applications of that both in the healthcare and making the society better, I think is humongous. So more power to you uh, and GTEC. Keep on doing what you're doing. And to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. Until next time, see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate this. Thank you very much, Eddie. It was very nice.